Hello everyone and welcome to DF Direct Weekly. It is our weekly news show where we talk about anything and everything in the industry today. And uh, we have a lot of exclusive leaks and juicy tidbits for you today. But we agreed with the publishers not to talk about them. That's a joke. <laughs> or is it? But less tight-lipped than me is Alex Battaglia. Hey there, I've read Jensen's prophecy, but I'm not going to talk about it, to say the least. And of course, joining me and Alex for today's little session is John Linden. I already broke it in by mentioning something earlier, but uh, I think we've all read that leak, Alex. And it's been rather prophetic at this point. So today's show, a little bit shorter than usual because all three of us, and you might be noticing someone's missing from the, uh, what is it, the triumphant? Uh... So we all have big videos in production, so it'll be a little bit short today, but we'll get through the biggest news items. And gentlemen, how about we just start with the first one? As I kind of alluded to in that introduction, my amazing introduction there, uh, Elden Ring, the footage and coverage is starting to roll out. There's a lot of impressions and such, and we have some as well. Uh, John, what are your first impressions here? Well, so this is an interesting one because I'm not actually covering the game for DF, but I'm very excited to play the game, and I have played some of the game. Uh, and it's tricky because the situation on consoles and the PC is disappointing to say the least, and you, you basically have to find a workaround if you want to achieve decent performance right now. Um, so where should I start here? Let's say... so. Originally, I'd said, well, I'll just buy the physical PS5 version and go with that. No, not not a good idea in the end, because it turns out the frame rate is very unstable in that version of the game. Uh, you know, it's it's usually above 50, but 50 to 60 feels terrible when you don't have VRR. So I immediately, I tested that on the DF account and just crossed it off the list. Um, then I went down and I, th I thought, all right, based on the test, PS4 Pro version running on PS5. Just as we guessed, it turns out that that's pretty much the only way, the only way to get a stable 60 frames per second right now on, I mean, I guess technically any platform. Yeah. So if you want 60 and you want to use like, you know, like I wanted 60 for using black frame insertion, that would have been great. Uh, this is literally the only option for that. So that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, I wanted to try to do the same on Xbox to see if I could use the One X version because presumably that's actually even better, but no go at that. But I did say, well, how about VRR? And this is where we kind of get to this, like, what what's the best choice? If, if you're on Xbox and you have a VRR display, then I'm going to say that Xbox is definitely the way to go. And that's actually how I think I'm going to wind up playing the game uh, because it basically saves it. So the frame rate is technically lower. It's often in the 40s. Uh, but anyone that's used it would know that, you know, VRR basically makes that look non-stuttery. You can tell the frame rate's dropping, but it feels smooth enough to play. And that's basically saves the day. So in, in that sense on those, like, and this comes from the perspective of me wanting to find the version I want to play. And so right now, the only two acceptable options in my book are either PS4 Pro and PS5 or the Xbox version with VRR. Everything else, uh, I think, is pretty bad. <laughs> and But, you know, I think we'll, we'll, continue, we'll talk about more about the game in a little bit here, but I actually think, Alex, you got to get a word in here because while I was looking at these different console versions, the news you were feeding back to me about the PC version was genuinely shocking. Yeah, so... This is from Software's first DirectX 12 game on PC. And one thing people in the audience need to understand about DirectX 12 is that majority of the game's frame rate health and how it plays and feels becomes the responsibility of the developer when you start using DirectX 12 on PC. Um, and it's a complex thing. It's a you know complex piece, memory management, threading, making sure a lot of things are actually loading correctly. And unfortunately, it, it appears uh, upon my contact with the game on a variety of PCs uh, that From Software has really failed in uh, making a good DirectX 12 version of their uh, game engine for Elden Ring on PC. Um, the game suffers from numerous completely unavoidable frame time issues. Um, and so, 
usually for a video when it comes out and I make a video for DF here, I spend a lot of time in the video discussing how to get good settings and what they do to your frame rate and things like that. Um, but in a case like this, it's almost unwarranted because that's not going to be the issue you're going to be dealing with. Uh, you're going to, if you play this game on PC, on any single PC, uh, your graphic settings in the end for a playable experience, a reasonable playable experience, don't really matter too much uh, because you'll be getting stutters uh, that are completely unav unavoidable. So you see new enemies, you see new effects, you see new areas. The game will stutter. The length of the stutter will depend. I don't know on what, but it's always reproducible. Uh, those type of stutters will technically go away in time as you play the game more often, and uh, these effects are cached, as they're called. Um, but then there are other types of stutter issues, like ones that happen all the time in cutscenes. And then uh, the more pervasive one is when you're just walking across the game world here, you get like uh, single frame drops, like, I don't know, it could happen up to like four to five times in one minute. That's not too bad, honestly. It's not at all good, but it's not too bad. But then you have these like really jarring, like extreme fluctuations and frame rates sometimes that appear to be tied to reloading as well uh, that you'll encounter. And generally, I just find that if the first 15 minutes of a game has really off-putting issues in it, like this one does, uh, then I just don't want to play it. And I say, put it down and wait for a patch. And I've said that before for games like Halo Infinite. We said it most recently also for Final Fantasy VII's remake on PC. And I'm going to say the same for Elden Ring here too, where I feel like this, this, the, the way it feels to play on PC, your first experience with the game is so critical. And I feel like it really botches that first player experience in a way that is surprising because um, from software stuff on PC, I have thought up, you know, like including Sekiro, I thought like Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3 and Sekiro were all really surprisingly awesome PC versions with some issues, of course, but this one feels uh, not good. Also, you were noting they still don't support frame rates above 60. They still don't support ultra wide display modes from what I've seen. Um, so they're still missing these like core PC features that should really be there at this point. But the point about the stuttering uh, lessening over time, to me, the real issue here is that it kind of kills the sense of exploration because as you explore new areas and see new things, which is what drives you to play the game, it's basically ruined by this. Uh, and that's not good. That's not really acceptable. No, it's definitely not the situation. I, like I said, I'm not going to play the game right now. I may have my own opinion about the game, but I would not want to play it anyway because of these issues. And I think, and it's such a messed up situation that playing a backwards compatible PS4 Pro version on PlayStation 5 is going to give you the, the most excellent experience. But honestly, a frankly not good looking experience, like visually. You lose a lot of visuals, but I think what makes that interesting is it basically highlights that they failed to do their job right in terms of optimizing the frame rate, right? The system can run it at 60 frames per second. I think they could still get there with less compromise than the PS4 Pro version actually has. Uh, but it's clear that they didn't place enough importance on actually maintaining a stable frame rate. Uh, they're close enough, I'd say. I'd, I'm a little baffled. It seems like they're sticking to perhaps an overly high resolution, maybe. Uh, their DRS is not set up correctly. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, what it feels that like. kind of yeah. thing. Like, they're close enough, but it's not good enough right now. And this is with the day one patch, by the way, that mm -hmm. we're speaking about. Yeah, day cases. one patch on PC as well. Too. The thing is, though, is like, we're talking about the high end options, right? The, the most powerful consoles and the PC. But if you got other platforms that you're playing on, it's, it's awful there. So, like, PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, for instance, they're just inherently uncapped, but always just between 30 and 40, and they feel terrible. Um, the base consoles, I haven't actually tested them, but I believe in the test they were capped at 30, but with bad frame pacing, uh, like Bloodborne. So that's bad. Uh, Series S, I think, is has an uncapped mode as well. I haven't actually tested that one, uh, but it seems to be comparable to Series X, just in lower res. So... It's it's a very disappointing situation because, you know, this is a game I'm very much looking forward to and I've enjoyed what I've played thus far. Um, and, yeah, it seems like From Software really needs to figure out the visual side of things.
Cause... Now, did you guys have the right sound card installed? Though? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> Can confirm. <laughs> yeah. Can confirm. I'm, I have like the right proper DMA and IRQ set up on my PC. This is all good. Yeah. I I'm using DMA uh, one with <laughs> IRQ five currently. Mm, yeah. It seems, good. It seems to be working okay. I'm DMA yeah. three IRQ seven. So. Oh, okay. Well, that's totally <laughs> fine as well. <laughs> yes, like you, because we we were talking about performance very heavy, of course. But uh, yeah, your impressions then, John, because I haven't played it yet. Uh, but it's kind of interesting because quite recently we also had a remake from another studio handling, you know, from uh, older game, right? So how this this you know, because the reviews coming out seems to suggest that this is performance aside. Uh, one of the guess, best games of the year. So what's kind of your impressions of the gameplay itself? I mean, I haven't played far enough to, to say that one way or another, but, you know, I I do personally still love Souls-style games. They're among my favorite of the last decade, uh, just because it's it takes the modern... It's like a combination of modern games, but with uh, almost an NES-like design, where it really pushes you to learn and adapt and become better at the game. And I find that actually quite engaging, uh, it's it's like you can die very quickly if you don't know what you're doing rather than like something like Assassin's Creed which is like a war of attrition you're just whittling things down and ultimately it's it, it's just mush and so I need to get further again but I'm really fascinated by what they're trying to do with the open world here because in general open like open worlds I don't love most of the time like I was able to enjoy Horizon because you can basically play that through like a linear game and you don't have to do that much with the world if you don't want to. But so many games have, have become just these giant lists of tasks to complete. You're running around, you're, you're looking at icons, you're completing tasks, everything is marked on a map. Everything feels like, okay, you must go do this. So you go to point on map, trigger event complete event, then go back to other point on map. And you're just connecting dots everywhere and checking these things off. And I actually think that that destroys the, the desire to explore. Um, mm, I haven't now, heard you talk about this before. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so now f from software though, um, their games have always had exceptionally good level design, very layered, you know, things sort of connecting to one another. It can be described as Metroid like, I suppose. Uh, but in 3D. Um, and they've sort of translated that to this open world as well, because this is a game that doesn't seem to hold your hand all that much. It really does ask you to kind of just go out there and start exploring and just figure out where to go and what to do. There's no list of things that you need to complete. Uh, it's exactly what I was hoping they would do with that. And I'm really curious to see where it goes, because I do think that this could... It's not going to work for every genre, but I do think that they, they have potentially managed to solve the whole exploration issue with open world games here. And that it, they've created something that you actually want to and actually need to explore. And the stuff you find is actually good. It's not just like, here's some loot. It's more like, here's here's like a world to explore. Here's a, an actual, what's, what amounts to like a level or a dungeon kind of thing. They're kind of breaking it down in that way. And I think that's really interesting. I'm just completely bummed out that they just can't seem to get the technology under control. And you mentioned like, you know, Blue Point's work on Demon Souls and I mean, obviously, I don't think a partnership there in terms of working on a new game like this would happen or make sense, but they are way ahead of from software on the tech side to say the least. I mean, I don't know what 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 do you guys think? I think John uh like I would say this reminds me of like an RPG like from the 90s in terms of you just like step out into the world and there's no actual like mission objective and you just kind of explore and then you find mission objectives for yourself. Uh, there's like NPCs and they play off of each other and things like that. That's what it really reminds me of. Um, and I think that's a great thing. I'm just a little bit personally tired of all the tropey souls things. So I, I'm less enamored with the game. Like the game starts off with you like dying and uh, you stop, you immediately start talking with cryptic NPCs that have, you know, like uh, British Isle accents and laugh uh, at, at nothing. You know, it's like it's almost like it's like being a, a meme place. at this point. Yeah, it's like I, I, I've seen this before. <laughs> I'm not as interested in the lore here to really dive further. But 
I want to also talk on the tech side of things. Like, I, they do have these like um, bespoke. Quote, I hate saying using that word now, but they have these areas that are designed like Metroidvania, uh, like really crafted levels. But in between them all, um, there is a bit of open world filler, and the terrain, the terrain is fine looking. It's not as uh, like it's not as vast, I would say, and just filled with empty crap like Assassin's Creed games are. But it also is not very attractive, uh, I would say, in general. Like the art design is nice, but the like the actual open world elements, like how rocks look, how trees look, how grass renders and renders out into the distance, are all not very handled well. So it, it does kind of break the immersive experience of moving across the terrain. Whereas Horizon, on the other hand, you know, masters that. It seems like Elden Ring, I think you mentioned Halo Infinite earlier, and they both kind of do a similar thing there with just, they, they don't have a great command of displaying distant objects in a way that looks visually attractive. I think Elden Ring has a more, uh, has a better silhouette for its world, but it's still, it feels very outdated. So I am actually very happy to see From Software thriving in terms of making games that a lot of people seem to care about because I have actually followed their work for a long time, going back to like the mid 90s. I mean, I have all the old Kingsfield games here. They were very janky, but the concept was the always there. Yes, we did. I mean, Kingsfield, <laughs> actual Kingsfield 1, the Japanese game that never came out in America, is just like, it's the most plain, but punch you in the face over and over kind of experience you can imagine. And then Kingsfield 2 slash 1 in the US, it's like you start the game, if you turn right and just press forward, you just fall in a lake and die immediately. It's it's hilarious, like but so they kept some things alive still. But it has that same <laughs> thing of like there's this weird world. There's a lot of ways to go. You're just kind of barely surviving, trying to figure out what's next. And I found it weirdly engaging, even back then, uh, despite the rough presentation. And that kind of held true throughout. And of course, you know they did a lot of other stuff too, like Armored Core. Of course, they had the Otogi games. Ninja Blade even was good fun on the 360. There was that PS2 game too, right? It was Eternal Ring. Of course, I mean, that was basically a Kingsfield game, but for launch. And Evergrace as well. Evergrace is not bad. Those, ga those games were slagged off at launch, but they're actually very decent. And, I mean, that's kind of how it was. Oh, The Adventures of Cookie and Cream. That's also good. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Like, legit. It's it's awesome. But uh, true. that's the thing. is From Software stuff, though, for so long just wasn't a big deal, wasn't popular. And now they've basically made it. And I think that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really cool to see, you know, a Japanese studio thrive, especially on PlayStation, right? It's very important that they thrive on PlayStation. I will say their technology has always been somewhat lousy. Let's be honest. That's one area where they have struggled throughout their entire lifetime. <laughs> it seems really crazy to me that this cannot hold a steady 60 on PS5. Like this, that, that alone just seems like cause for concern on their engine they made some weird choices <laughs> uh, i think that's what we have to say about elden ring at this point there will be lots of coverage on this of course in df uh, i'm not sure when but maybe even by the time this is out there will have been one video so look forward to that i'm sure this discussion will come up again and again in the coming weeks but uh, for now Let's move on to the next topic. And this isn't much of a topic at all, actually. Uh, this isn't much of a news bit, but just kind of a heads up. And that is that Richard is not here today, of course, as you can see, unless you think I'm very similar to him. Uh, <laughs> but Steam Deck coverage will be incoming. And I, we just wanted to note this quickly because I think a lot of people are kind of looking towards our channel to find out about Steam Deck very soon. So there will be a lot of Steam Deck in the next week. Uh, and Richard will be back to answer all the questions about that. Uh, anything you guys want to add to the very brief mention of Steam Deck here? I will probably be getting a unit at some point in time, and I've been seeing a lot of questions from our Patreon supporters as well as on Twitter, whether I'm going to integrate it in a, like a consistent way into uh, my PC gaming videos. And the answer is going to be like, like 40% yes. Um, I'm going to try and cover it, but I already cover so much stuff on PC. Like my PC videos are stupidly long. It's super, like it's really hard to make a PC video, honestly. Like and adding the Steam Deck into it, uh, not for every video may not even at all be possible. So I will cover it, but 
uh, just not immediately and not so consistently. It's an interesting device that has a lot of rough edges still, but there's a lot of potential there if they can get everything working correctly in the end. Uh, some of the performance numbers have been really interesting. Um, and it does kind of feel like they're they're really doing something that's, you know, closing in on like a portable PS4 to some degree. Yeah, I think that's the one thing I would want to do with this unit uh, when time allows and uh, alongside John or something is to look at emulation on Steam Deck. I think that would be a really fun video. Yeah, Steam Deck, it's coming. We are going to do a lot with it. And uh, I really look forward to what Rich has in store because he's been working very hard on it. He's doing it right and, now. Uh, <laughs> he's right doing... now as we speak, as of this recording. He is yes. working on it, so mm. it's going to be massive. But that's what, all we have to say about the Steam Deck. Mm. We just wanted to have Steam Deck in the description so that you click this video. And we just did that. The Bethesda launcher is no more. Soon it is no more. And it seems that the Bethesda launcher will mostly remain, the accounts will remain, but things will be moved over to Steam so people playing like Fallout 76 can continue to use their previously held accounts there. Uh, Alex, what's the scoop here on the Bethesda launcher? How did that work out for you? Well, I never really wanted to use it because, uh, <laughs> I, uh, like, one, it, it miss, it's missing a lot of features uh, that a lot of other launchers have, namely Steam. Steam is the thing you should always compare to because it's the best. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, there was this kind of, like Rich always says, friction of wanting to play a game using something that is not Steam. Uh, some launchers I have to tolerate, like EGS, but things like this, I would always just never want to even download on my PC. Uh, so it is really good uh, from a PC player's perspective to see that uh, this will now make sure that Bethesda games uh, do not have to separately open up the launcher when you buy them elsewhere, for example, and uh, that things moving to Steam, because honestly, Steam is still, like, in terms of quality, feature set, downloading, all these other things, the top dog in the PC space. I would love to see uh, Microsoft Windows Store Xbox app, PC app, also uh, kind of reach quality level features that I see on Steam. Uh, but seeing this thing now moving out of the way, that makes me happy for future Bethesda titles. And I hope uh, this also signals that they get rid of the Bethesda login crap at some point, too. Uh, you know, John, you know, like you log into your Doom account and there's like a Bethesda login on your Switch. <laughs> and you got your yeah, little Bethesda login. That would be my login. question regarding all this. It's just kind of like what happens with the console side. I'm guessing that the login will remain for a while. Uh, yeah, yeah I, right. I think so too. Yeah. Because the accounts will still be there. Uh, which is important to note if you're having to read the news is that, you know, are, if you are playing any kind of Bethesda service game, uh, your account will not be deleted in April. Uh, it's just that the launcher will be moving to Steam in April. My opinion is in line with Alex's where, <laughs> I mean, really, it's just, I don't like having, I re, when I rebuilt my PC recently, which I talked about on the 1DF Direct, I had to, it was like, all right, what games do I want to test? And then you start installing them and realize, oh my gosh, I got to install this launcher, and then I got to install this launcher, and then this one. And I understand you don't want, like, just a full-on monopoly in the PC digital space necessarily, uh, but it sure is a pain in the butt having to install all of those, right? I don't... I'm okay with more agnostic sort of launchers, like a the GOG launcher, like Galaxy, you know, even EGS, and then Steam, because they, they're... They support so so such a wide range of titles, but when specific publishers have these launchers, it's just a pain in the butt. Nobody wants the U Ubisoft launcher or this Bethesda the thing launcher. or Origin from you know, <laughs> Rockstar Net Club. Activision. Oh, <laughs> like, I hate all of that stuff. Like we don't want it. It's it's annoying, and I know why they do it, but it it sure does. Uh, become frustrating when your PC's clogged with these launchers. Well, if you log into the Rockstar Club, you get a free cowboy hat in GTA. Woo. <laughs> when you have these publisher-specific launchers, it gets very annoying on PC side. And, you know, it's it's less of a problem today, I think, than what, but like 10 years ago. A bad example, but I just remember like buying Flashback, right? That remake from Ubisoft. And it required their launcher, and I was just kind of turned off by all the extra steps I had to do to play it. So I just bought on PS3 instead and played the game within seconds. 
Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> I, I'm trying good. to figure out though, Audi. Was it actually a good thing that you were able to play the flashback remake in just a few seconds? No. Uh, at the time, I was reviewing it for Detroit, uh, and I actually hated the game so much I turned down to do the review. So I sent sent Sterling a stern message about not having me play that game again yeah <laughs> so your pc what is was trying to say again? It's trying Bethesda. to say you. <laughs> yes <laughs> the fact launcher there's no more people uh april is when they are transitioning over uh it will take some time and um so but again for those who play fallout 76 which is quite a lot of you actually um so su- was surprised to read that uh not that it's a bad game or anything uh but uh, your accounts will remain all your stuff is still there, so don't worry. Piece of news, very interesting to us. Uh, there is a new shooter in town. It's called Soul Cresta from Platinum Games. Uh, there, I'm just gonna put footage here. I'll be quiet for a moment, and I'll put footage here. Make sure you zoom just in. Look. Yeah. And here, yeah, I'm zooming in. Just look at this. Just look at this. <laughs> what do you think about this? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs> Click yeah. like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah. And sign up for a newsletter. Yeah. But yeah, this... Uh, so, uh, John has been quite excited for this game. Uh, I've been excited for the soundtrack, uh, primarily. Soul Cresta came out. Uh, it, I believe it uses Unity. And let's just... Let's just get it on with here, John. Let's talk about, you know, s- scaling. Let's talk about graphics. Let's talk about the things that makes us happy and sad at the same time. Platinum. I know I love you guys, but <laughs> so essentially this this is a game that's trying to replicate sort of that 32-bit style of pixel art where it's kind of actually more like CG renders transformed into low res objects is kind of the aesthetic they're going for, which you know, whatever, that's it's an interesting idea. But as you can see from the footage, um, there's two. There's actually two problems with this. First of all, the pixel scaling is completely botched. Uh, it's actually probably the worst I've ever seen. So let's say you have like, imagine a grid, right, of of twelve twelve by twelve pixels, right? We'll say each pixel occupies uh, four pixels on your LCD panel. Okay, so you have two two pixels vertical and then the next square will also be two pixels and then the next square above that is also two pixels high right so it creates this even repeating pattern that results in clean looking artwork the problem here is that essentially the scaling is so messed up that this artwork is essentially distorted so if you think vertically again you'll have like one pixel and then you'll have three pixels and then you'll have two and then three, then one, then two, in in any direction. So if you had that same square of squares, the checkerboard pattern, the whole thing would just be this uneven mess of variable size squares, right? Because it's not correctly scaled. So every piece of artwork that they made for this, every ship, background element, all this stuff, it just ends up looking messy. Because they are going for a low-resolution look, but because of the distorted scaling it's almost hard to even parse what you're looking at. So, and not only that, it's not just baked into the artwork, like the act razor thing that we covered last year that also had some weird issues with its art. Uh, but that was baked into the actual assets. So it kind of scrolled without shimmering or looking too bad. Uh, here, the scaling actually impacts the way stuff moves. So as the screen scrolls vertically, the whole thing shimmers because like, as the pic, let's say a, a, you have a, a single pixel as it moves up the screen, it's actually changing width or height, right? Height basically, right? So you go one pixel, now it's three pixels, now it's two pixels, and it's kind of just creating this effect that gives it this like shimmery, uh, incorrect look. It's very ugly. Uh, it's really, really bad looking in motion. And then to add insult to the injury on that, you look at specifically the Switch version. And the game runs so poorly. I mean, this is a 2D shoot 'em up. It should be 60 frames per second. But not only does it not get there, the whole thing just has this constant judder, 
like weird stuttering, like just a strange, unsmooth feeling to it. Uh, so when you combine that with the pixel scaling, like it went from like, oh yeah, I can't wait to order this game to what have they done? <laughs> like, what have I, I ordered? <laughs> I genuinely don't, I don't understand how Platinum's designers looked at this and thought, yeah, this is okay. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely crushed by it. Like, I don't understand why they thought they should ship it this way. And it's a shame because the underlying game is well made. There's a good game here, but they were let down by some technical decisions here that absolutely destroy all the hard work that they put into actually creating the assets. It's very strange, right? Because there's, you know, Camilla is so into like Terra Cresta and like just, you know, it seemed like such a passion project. And when I saw this, I couldn't believe my eyes. And I was reading some of other people's kind of impressions because I was kind of curious if I'm crazy, if you're crazy. Or if like well, I am, you but... know, in, well, yes, but <laughs> uh, even more so. And I was reading it. People were like, oh, "I don't mind so much because it looks like a food tube at PlayStation shooter." It's like, no, it doesn't. I'll put a uh, footage here. I, there's, these are three different shooters on PlayStation. None of them look like this. This just looks awful, and it feels awful. Like, even though, yes, as John said, the underlying game is fine. It's pretty good. But, like, the entire experience is awful to look at. If you close your eyes, it's a better game, almost. <laughs> and that's not <laughs> really advantageous better. for a shooter. No. See, I kind of describe the look as... So, like, let's say you had a Saturn game where you're scaling in and out, right? Um, because of, the hardware doesn't have interpolation, so the pixels would appear uneven during the scaling. And usually developers would settle on different distances to stop. So that you get reasonably even scaling. Here it looks like they were doing a, a nearest neighbor style scale and then just kind of stopped at some arbitrary position. Like, oh yeah, this fills the screen. I'll just stretch it to this. Uh, and then you couple this. They have these CRT filters, which are the worst I've ever seen, where they're trying to simulate. They want to give it this look of like a shadow mask, kind of a tube. So it's not just lines. But problem is, is one, it's impacted by the bad scaling. And two... It's so aggressive in terms of how it's drawn that it actually, it's like putting a screen door over your TV. It makes everything yeah, about... It's like wearing sunglasses. Yeah, it's like 75% less bright. Uh, it's very dim. It actually becomes hard to see what you're even looking at anymore. Like, I don't know who was in charge of this side of things, but they really need to go back and look at this. Because I think there's a game worth saving here, but man... You can tell I'm pretty I'm pretty bummed out by this. Yeah, I wonder how much can be saved. I wonder how much it's like just it that based on based on the performance here, right? You would think this is a Unity game. Oh, uh, I think somebody unearthed within the licensing and credits or somewhere that it actually is. And again, we can't just blame Unity here because Unity can absolutely this is not a Unity problem. This is a, a usage of the engine problem. So this is their their developers making some weird choices and, and missing things. Unfamiliarity without the use Unity seems to be kind of the issue here. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure it made development easier, but it certainly needs some work in. What doesn't need work in, though, and we will highlight, is the soundtrack. Because, my God, my God. That's very the good. The soundtrack is very good by Yuzo Koshiro. So... Uh, just a fantastic soundtrack. And it, it, it really bumps me out, though, that I, you know, this, I think the reason why John and I feel this way is that when you play it, you kind of feel like there is almost like a classic here, but there's this huge, huge cloud over it that makes it so that, you know, I don't think people will be picking this up yeah, like other shooters, you know. It's hard to look so, at. It's mm -hmm. really hard to look at. Play it with your back, turn to it, and uh, maybe you'll have a good experience. I I hate improper scaling. I think I've talked about this with John before. It's actually why I don't like scalar effects on things like the Saturn. Uh, sometimes, like when they happen, like when they twist and twirl, because I see them flickering, and it's like it just it just doesn't look like it's part of the proper pixel grid at that moment. Uh, so, so I, I really dislike that. And to see a modern game trying to throw back, but just like mess up the throwback aspect uh it's just sad it's just sad it's a bit surprising too considering who was involved but um you know here's hoping for a patch there's still time it can still be saved
the universe can't still be in order. So let's see what happens. Uh, we just wanted to put a little bit of emphasis on this and hope that, you know, with a future patch or something, we could have an amazing game. Because underneath all this dirt, there is a treasure. So Street Fighter 6 is announced. I hope you guys like feet. Because I don't. <laughs> uh, but there is a lot to take away from very little uh, in this uh, wide lens uh, angle that you can see here. Uh, yes, uh, we'll talk about the art direction, we'll talk about all that stuff, uh, but Street Fighter Six is coming out. They are confirming, of course, that Ryu is still sexy to you. He has the beard. Uh, he has also many other things. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, then, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Luke is... Uh, they did say when they debuted Luke in Five that he was kind of the next generation of characters, so they are kind of confirming that here. And uh, the game seems, at least from my eyes, it seems to be running in the RE engine. I would assume so, being Capcom, that that is kind of the engine they move forward with with most of their games. Even Ghosts and Goblins ran on RE engine, didn't it, John? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I have a lot of things I wanted to talk about here, but what was your reaction, John, when you saw Street Fighter VI? I mean, there's just not much to say yet, but it felt like they were showing it in the wrong aspect ratio where you was like super wide for some reason and it just looked bizarre i've seen people make the joke that like you can go on retro tink and you know select the right yeah. uh, aspect ratio it's about right um yeah obviously there's been a lot of talk about the logo thing which was kind of bizarre at the end where you know they just you they, they licensed a logo from adobe that has sf and they attached a six to it technically nothing wrong with that i suppose but it's not great looking and I hope it's just placeholder because, you know, it doesn't really fit in with Street Fighter in general. But between that and the way this is teased, I mean, the whole thing feels like they're they're not ready to show this game yet. I mean, do, do you have to be so much ready, though? I mean, it's a teaser. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> teaser, they, they do show quite a bit. Uh, they show a lot more. But they show a lot. Sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, Street Fighter is in an interesting position because it is the marquee name in the fighting gaming community for tournaments for whatnot and street fighter 5 was uh today and i you know even when it came out i thought that was one of the best games that i ever played i really enjoyed street fighter 5 uh by now it is one of the best fighters ever made it's a fantastic game if you have not played street fighter 5 arcade edition pick it up because it is quite good uh so what they need here is strong first impressions and I thought this was kind of weird because for a teaser, there's not much to be, needs to be shown, but they show kind of, uh, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't really have the impact I think they want to, this kind of excitement, because you have the logo is a minor thing, but it's just kind of silly. Uh, but Street Fighter VI needs to come out of the gate quite strong to make up for the launch of Street Fighter V, because V's launch was uh, kind of a disaster. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's was. no other way of describing it. I'm more curious about the engine stuff um, to see if they actually do switch to RE Engine because, you know, the last game used Unreal Engine 4, which unfortunately I think has some, especially on PlayStation, the latency out of UE4 is not great. Uh, I can't say for sure because you can kind of do it, do anything in Unreal, of course, but... The the way the characters are lit and shaded here does kind of look more RE Engine, I think. It's interesting to see, though, because the art direction in here is very different from RE Engine's, you know, look on, like, for example, Resident Evil. Oh, sure, but, you know, it ha there's something about it that, that is reminiscent of that. I think some of the shading on the skin and everything, presuming that that is, you know... I think those are real models. I'm sure it's a rendered out trailer, but it's it, they're obviously using like you know real 3D assets that they've likely made for the game to do it. it but it doesn't really look very unreal anymore. Uh, in a way, that, like you know, I don't know. Street Fighter V was weird because it looked kind of good at times, but also kind of not, depending on how you kind of caught it. So fighting words there. I think in motion, it's one of the most beautiful game. It looks good. I've, I've it looks seen. good in motion, I suppose. It's yeah. true. It is it is like you know, the term poetry in motion, that's why I would use for Street Fighter <laughs> Five. Uh but in stills, you know, or in you know, close ups, uh it does not look that great. I totally agree. But when you see a fight, it is beautiful. I just I'm still bummed out we never got 
Tekken Cross Street Fighter. It's you know? still in development, they keep saying. Oh, yeah. That's uh, a, uh, but I got to say, the art, the style here of the characters and the way they're rendered is definitely sort of inching towards that Tekken look a little mm, bit. So, Oh, it is. The uh, dream is not dead, I maintain. <laughs> one thing I'll notice, uh, if, the, if they do follow through with some of the art decisions that are shown in this trailer... If you look at the hair, it is not the style of hair that they've been doing since, uh, I would say, Street Fighter V, you know, where it's like big clumps in Street Fighter V. Uh, here, it was actually like individual strands were visible. So you won't get the banana hair issue uh, that we saw in Street Fighter uh, V. Uh, which Are you everyone... calling out Ken? <laughs> yeah, the I'm calling out hair. Ken's banana hair. Um, one thing I'm also curious about, I don't think they mentioned this, was uh, platform support. Uh, you know, Street Fighter V was PS5 and PC exclusive. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of people during the Xbox 360, PS3 era switched to Xbox 360 to play uh, Street Fighter IV, and then it kind of, like, went backwards uh, to play a PlayStation 5. So it would be interesting to see if this is, once again, fully multi-platform. And if it has, cross-play. Because fighting game communities are small when they're gated, even for something like Street Fighter, I would say, they're not like uh, Counter-Strike or Fortnite or whatever. So the community is a little bit insular. But if you could have anyone on any platform playing Street Fighter, that'd be great. Yeah, they seem to make keep that ambiguous here. And I would assume that is because it is multi-platform. I think if, what, if it was exclusive, that would be kind of one of the first things they announced, right? Because whoever's funding that wants, you know, the exclusivity known. So my guess is that this would be um, multi-platform. I can only hope so. I don't know if they'll do it because the fighting game community is weird around this, but I would like to see it uh, have a 120 hertz mode. Yeah, this we've talked about that before, and Sam, Sam Show has it. Uh, it's quite good, uh, but I do think that it's... I want to understand it screws up some of the um, frame timing between like uh, the higher tier uh players yeah i guess it's i can't really speak on this because I, I i don't fight at that level obviously but the support should be there anyway right i mean what you're talking about is an option you're not talking about uh, that as the standard no there's a lot of things i hope for this uh which we'll go into as the game becomes more known in summer because they did say that more information is coming in summer uh but there are certain uh, i really hope they change how froze and such were handling five I uh, certainly hope how the game launches will be very different. Uh, yeah, it should be it, actually it have real content. <laughs> the Street Fighter V felt like a bare bones, just like, here's a menu system that will eventually contain things. <laughs> yeah, right. Early access is what <laughs> yeah. it basically was. Exactly. Uh, they just didn't say that. And if, you know, imagine how different it would be if they just did say that. So, but yeah. Uh, also, Alex, you mentioned the art direction, and people have been very kind of up in arms about how wide they are. I I never quite get that because if you look at Akiman's art from like the nineties, it's very wide. It's just kind of kept that aesthetic alive. So it could also do due to the fact that you know two D art is always seen from a certain perspective, but with the three D model, wideness uh, takes on an, I would say new proportions. You know, like Years of War, uh, like if you were to draw those people as two D characters, they look kind of reasonable for a two D. Thing, but then as soon as you realize that if you turn the shoulder to the side that their shoulder is like larger than their like face like that's when it starts uh looking different because 3d changes things i don't know but i get what you're saying i do agree with you they all just look like bill goldberg in the 90s <laughs> yes exactly i you know i actually would have loved to have seen them take a page from what uh, arc system works is doing with the guilty gear games and sort of try to replicate the street fighter third strike era you know the street fighter 3 era um in 3d you know the main trick that they use there is a uh, keyframing of animations without interpolation and they sort of draw or, or model in the sense of motion into the frame so like you know you have, if you look at individual frames you'll see like blurred colors kind of like something that was animated like actually part of the model in a way and that stuff looks really convincing as like actual 2d graphics i think that would have been cool for street fighter but at the same time we also had street fighter ex so i guess stay in 3d whatever <laughs> it is what it is so i hope the music in six will be just as good as ex because that's still probably the, won't be uh, but it should it, they should it's they should. the height of street fighter music right there towards summer i'm sure we'll return to the subject of street fighter six they have announced that they will be showing off more during that time so right now everything is just speculation 
So hope for multi-platform, hope for improvements, and hope for good times. But let's move on to the next subject. Oh wait, we didn't talk about Ryu's massive Unreal Engine 5 is finally leaving early access. Alex, take us up to speed here. Yeah, so it's still technically not a numbered full release because, um, you know, like UE4.27 is still like the mainline branch that they're throwing out there. But it's now in a preview build status where it's actually currently using the latest, from what I understand, updates that they've been in the background. You've been actually been able to upgrade your Unreal Engine 5 and compile it yourself using whatever they're doing uh, like the, the latest stuff internally, uh, but that was, you know, like cost, you know, like you'd have to compile all these things, download all the GitHub source and everything, a knowing process, but now it's compiled in a previewable form. And it includes a lot of really great stuff that we recently saw in the uh, the Matrix demo, including stuff like hardware um, uh, accelerated uh, Lumen, which is great. And it even includes some stuff that were not uh, exactly visible in that demo, for example, I think transparency reflections uh, were not in the Enter the Matrix or <laughs> Enter the Matrix. Oh my God! In the in the Matrix demo that we saw, Matrix Awakens demo, uh, and so that is really awesome to see here. And I just think generally uh, that this is great momentum because when it came out in the early access, I mean, we looked at it, but we could obviously spot the rough edges and we saw that it was still going to take quite a while before uh, titles are going to be targeting this technology, both, you know, uh, on next gen, current gen consoles and on PC. But now we're moving one step closer and you can dip your hands into it as well. You can try it out if you want. And I think this is great. And I think we're as a result, we're actually going to be seeing maybe Unreal Engine 5 titles uh, quicker than we thought earlier, because I think the engine is actually making some uh, pretty awesome progress. I'm excited that hardware accelerated lumens available, so I can find I can enhance my own virtual sets, and finally solve some of those issues with the reflective materials looking slightly broken. So that's great. <laughs> Alrighty, well that kind of finishes up the news for this week. A little bit shorter this week, as I mentioned, because we have work to do. Uh, this is probably one of the busiest weeks we've had so far this year. So, uh, gotta get through it. Gotta do it. Gotta believe. So, let's move over to the next segment. Uh, since we're all working on videos, uh, we are skipping the DF content discussion and jumping straight to the Q&A, just so that we can actually finish these videos rather than talking about them. <laughs> Our first question comes... From Christopher K. Keep up the amazing work and the increasing output. Love your analytical and serious approach without being unempathetic. Weird question. Does your me 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 does your mechanistic understanding of how video games and graphics work get in the way of experiencing the games you play? It sometimes seems like the more you know, the more difficult it gets to get lost in the video game magic. John. Uh definitely. It depends on different flaws have a different impact on the experience. I mean, you know, there's there's various things from weird rendering issues to like frame rate performance and, you know, whether or not it plays nicely with your PC, you know, all those things can certainly get in the way. And I think that's not untrue for other people, but uh, it can be difficult to look past it sometimes. And I feel like there's almost like this once something is pat no longer cutting edge i'm able to more easily like ignore that like if i'm using a pc from 20 years ago you know you kind of just put up with with the issues and like yeah that's how it was but when you're playing a new game you really want those things to not be a problem you know so like elden ring of course with its issues is impacting my ability to get into it which is a shame. Well, you don't seem to be too fussed about technical issues, Alex. Oh, definitely not. I uh, <laughs> I love uh, technical <laughs> issues in video games. Um, yes, Christopher, uh, it does get in the way of enjoying video game magic, but in the same way, I would say this applies to all media for all people who love media and know the technical makings of media. So if you are a story writer yourself and you see contrived story elements in whatever you're consuming, you may also just be thrown out of that. If you're a filmmaker and you see the boom mic in a number of shots, you may also be thrown out of it too. So, you know, I, I, yeah, it is a little bit sucky for us who, who just can't, you know, live with Ocarina of Time frame rates these days, but you know, I think that's that's fine, and the magic is only enhanced when things are more flawless for me. 
I'm just going to come straight up and say a digital foundry really ruined my life. Because <laughs> before I was in digital foundry, uh, well, I did, I was sensitive to um, frame rate. Uh, I did notice uh, stutter and I did notice that drops and stuff like that. So I didn't like that. But now uh, there is so many more things I notice and I sit and think all the time when I play a new game. I wonder what Alex thinks of this. I wonder what John thinks about that. <laughs> and I start messaging them. So. Uh, it has changed the way I look at games, and I come in. I came into DF with a little bit of a different background. Uh, I did, of course, uh, did work as a developer, but um, I didn't really come in with much of an analytical edge to how I looked at games. So it's interesting to see that change. But I wouldn't say I'd lo I haven't lost my interest in video game magic. It doesn't really get in the way of it because I'm much more interested in expressionism and these kind of like artistic aspects of video games. So I think I'm a little bit less um, critical of those things, just as a person. I understand as, as a workplace, it's different. But as a person, I can look past a few more things, maybe, without getting too irritated. But it's it's slimming down. It's it's becoming more and more of an issue. Next question from Jonas Lashon Tagisele. Were you surprised by the strong negative backlash from console gamers regarding the image quality on Horizon Forbidden West? I found it quite unexpected considering that PC gamers and PC gaming tech reviewers at least often express that they prefer sharpness over more soft TAA presentations. Are console gamers and PC gamers really that different in this regard? Alex. We've talked about it twice now before. Recently, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Dying Light 2, and probably something else that I'm actually forgetting. Uh, but expectations versus what is real, really feasible or what we know is happening uh, behind the scenes. John's covered this game completely. I wrote a bit about it on Twitter, but you know, we know the technical makeup of this game, what it's doing in its performance mode and things like that. And it should not be so surprising that they're, of course, running a game as gorgeous as this one at 60 FPS will require some sacrifices in image quality and things like that. Um, so it did also take me aback too. I was actually, <laughs> I don't know what people are necessarily expecting there, um, maybe John has an idea of what people are expecting that, uh, that I'm not seeing, but uh, this game is really good looking and there's a lot of stuff that just, you know, goes into the image there that will make it uh, a bit rougher uh, when targeting 60 FPS. And um, usually on PC, um, you know, people really, like the, the comment says, people really hate TAA on PC for some reason. I love it. Um, uh, and here this game is a bit sharper than other games may be found on console. Uh, and yet it has a very negative, uh, uh, review there. I don't know, John. I think there's kind of two sides to it. There's, there's the, there was the performance thing you mentioned, which, you know, as noted, I also agreed that the performance where didn't look great in practice, but it kind of makes sense given what the game's doing. Um, I do think, you know, if they were stronger with the way they utilize TAA or, and there, there's probably things that they could do to get that same performance and basically blur out the image to make it look less aliased because they're dealing with all that fine detail and all the foliage and that stuff is difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there was also the stuff with the 30 FPS mode, which was really interesting. And I've seen a lot of that going around. Essentially there's like a, a very slight brightness dip when you move. And I think it's due to the TAA and specifically with the way that they sort of almost over sharpen the game, which I thought looked pretty good and interesting, uh, but some people don't like it. And I do think it is exacerbated by two things. Uh, one, if you enable HDR, it's much worse. And I played most of the game without HDR because I was capturing. So course, it's not yeah. really noticeable that way. And two, um, also if you have higher sharpness settings on your TV, it also exacerbates the issue a lot. And I actually think it's this combination of, of the way they're doing TAA combined with some of the limitations of modern flat panels all kind of coming together to create this situation that I've seen this before in other games. So I'm a little surprised that some people were so, uh, like noticing this so strongly, but it's a really mm -hmm. bizarre thing. And I think I, especially when you come on from, if you look like a couple weeks earlier, Dying Light 2 came out. And it uses a really aggressive TAA. So the foliage and everything is very, very soft. People went nuts over that. They complained all over the place. And then this comes out, and now it's the opposite, where it's overly sharp. So I can see where people want this sort of middle ground, and I kind of get that. I think it is tough for the developers sometimes to nail this. And it's it's not... 
I think the big disconnect is it's not so trivial just to click the make it look this way button like people seem to think. No. Uh, and a lot of how you handle anti-aliasing and such, it's a really difficult problem uh, with the way modern graphics can be. And you have to vary it based on the content. Like this is super heavy on foliage and if you know tons of fine texture detail that's really, really fine in a way that they were trying to go for this super pin sharp, like extra sharp look. And I think that this is kind of the, the issue with it. I think to solve it, essentially you're going to have to, it's If you want to fix this mode, the game's going to be blurrier and that's basically when it's going to have to be. Yeah. So, um, which I hope they make, if they do make adjustments, I hope it's at least optional <laughs> because I like the sharp presentation and I think it looks quite good. Um, but yeah, you, you, they're going to have to make some changes if they want to solve this completely, I think. Also, the Horizon was interesting, though, because this is this is a case of like where it felt like usually when a when a patch comes out, you expect it to fix things or at least not break things that weren't previously broken. And there's been some mm-hmm. issues that that showed up in the in the launch day patch with like the game suddenly like seizing up and running very strangely requiring a reboot of the system to fix. Uh, none of that happened in my 40 plus hours of play. And then suddenly this latest patch, it appears, right? Yeah. And that stuff Aggression. sucks because your coverage is done and dusted and then something comes out and it makes a change. That's perhaps not for the best. Although they did just release another patch. What's clear to me, though, through all of this, from all the games we've been covering, is that the COVID situation has really screwed things up for a lot of developers in terms of being able to as robustly test these things as as they would like, right? Uh, And I think Mm -hmm. that's why so many games are shipping with these issues. It was the same with a lot of the big games we, we covered last year. And that's why I also don't think we tend to not focus that heavily on this stuff in the standalone videos, because that stuff doesn't age well and... It's, I, I don't think it's that interesting. I, I think the tech itself is more interesting. There was bugs like this in Forza Horizon as well. People kept tweeting me pictures of cars falling out of the world, just like they're doing with, with Horizon. And it's like, guys, like we're not the QA department here. <laughs> no, we are not. You know, like, like this stuff, it sucks when that happens, but that's not what we're here to talk about. It's only really talked about when it's like actual visual problems that we encounter that feel like they could be solved in, in a way. It's not just like a bug, right? So, I don't know. It's complicated. Modern games are tough to examine these days. Uh, whereas, like, Elden Ring, it's like, we, we did actually wait for that day one patch, and guess what? It didn't make a difference. It <laughs> so, did not make a difference, no. It, nothing changed. So, it's uh, it's frustrating. The, the, the nature of covering these games the way we do, it's hard. And I think... Alex and I especially, our, our focus has become more and more on discussing the technology that makes these games possible and trying to showcase it rather than just like poking holes in it and pointing out bugs, right? Unless it really falls short, like Elden Ring, in which case it's like, well. <laughs> Alrighty, so next question from Nicolas Z. Hello, DF team. I had recently built a computer with an i9. 100 uh, 10900k a PCIe 3.0 CPU and I was looking to wait for a 40 series GPU to release to pair the two. I was initially worried new Nvidia cards would begin to show performance loss on the PCIe 3.0 motherboards, but it seems at least with the 40 series as far as anyone knows, there's not too much to worry about yet. When do you think PCIe 4.0 would will show a large GPU performance gains over 3.0. I know the recent AMD card, 6500 uh, XT, I think, did, but that was due to memory lane and lane limits. Man, that question just encapsulates why I dropped out of school. <laughs> Alex. Uh, well, so, Nick, if I may, um, I don't think you're actually going to be seeing uh, at least in your typical PC multi-platform release, any issues from being a uh, PCI 3.0 
16x lane whatever uh, GPU that you'll hook up there to your 10900K. I am also using a 3.0 system and a 4.0 system right next to each other with uh, RTX 3000 series cards. And um, I've only ever noticed an issue when they were not running at 16x. Uh, and you're going to be running at 16x. And I honestly, I cannot think of any game in the near future that would be wanting to exploit the PCIe bus so much that it would cause issues. I don't think games are designed that way, especially those for PC. So I think you're fine, Nick. Um, maybe worry about it in like five years <laughs> when you maybe become CPU limited in some game but that will have have nothing to do with the PCIe lanes thing. Yeah, I think that was key, Alex. Is he's much more likely to become CPU limited before the PCIe bus ever has an impact on anything. So Next question from Al Kesse. Do any of you have any idea why AMD is dragging their feet on the DLSS equivalent? They have a Tensor Core-ish equivalent on the new consoles, right? The silicon that is being used for RT. I, I would say that I don't think they're dragging their feet. I think uh, just... NVIDIA has spent probably, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars, US dollars, in uh, uh, investing into AI research and suitably putting a very fast accelerator into their GPUs and also their non, uh, you know, consumer uh, accelerator markets. They have like AI accelerators and things. Um, so NVIDIA is actually like ahead of the curve. And AMD is just at the normal spot, I would say, where a company that is focusing on graphics technology would be. Like, I don't think they're dragging their feet. I don't think that's the proper uh, uh, analogy. Uh, but you say they have Tensor Core-ish equivalents in the new consoles. They really don't. Uh, and we also, by the way, we, don't, we still don't have any confirmation whether or not PS5 actually accelerates 8 int stuff like four times uh, or four int stuff like the way Xbox Series X does. And the, and I would say based upon the way these, these companies tend to advertise things, I think it's probably because it doesn't have it. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a difference in power there. Like we've, you know, we'll see. I, I don't think AMD is going to be making a DLSS equivalent anytime soon. They haven't posted anything about it. Rather, I would start looking towards Intel. And uh, there they have XESS, which is going to have an accelerated variant. Uh, and also one that runs DP4A probably also is accelerated on things like RDNA 2 on PC as well as uh, NVIDIA's Turing and MP or so. I would look in that direction for now and be happy with what Intel puts out because it's probably going to be pretty OK. And we're going to review it when it comes out for sure. There it is. There it is. That Alex magic. Bam. <laughs> Bam. Next question from Mernschipnerch. Uh, M. M. Merten Peters. I think that's the right way. <laughs> that's to say good. It. Yeah. Merten Peters. Yeah. M M Mr. T and P. Tierras. Uh, what? Uh, what do you think? What do you guys think about the graphics between Elden Ring and Blue Point's Demon Souls remake from 2020? Elden Ring director Miyazaki Hidetaka said that Demon Soul put his, his team under the extra pressure to improve Elden Ring's graphical fidelity. Do you feel like they succeeded in that aspect of the game, John? No. Next question. No, no. I mean, I, I of course I like I love their art direction, and you know, but. We talked about it in the first segment. Like it's pretty clear that they are not playing in the same pool in terms of technology, uh, and you know, not, not every developer is there, and that's that's fine, I guess. I just wish they would sort their performance issues, but you know, uh, it's not a stunning game visually. But you know, again, gameplay is obviously king here. Um, there's been plenty of great games <laughs> that are not amazing looking, and that's fine. We're not just playing the technology. One thing I wish they would learn, though, from the Demon's Souls remake is that the Demon's Souls remake always tried to have motivated lights, like lights where you could see, like, that's a light right there, and it casts shadows. And a lot of lights in uh, Elden, I was about to call it Elden Souls, Elden Ring, um, just don't cast shadows. There's like one or two here or there at like very specific points and they feel like arbitrary, but I feel like that's something where like, that would be a great option for like PS5 
over like PS4, for example. And that, that'd be something I wish they would learn uh, from, from the Demon Souls people. Audi, though, I do have a question for you. Do you think, so you had Demon Souls and then you had Dark Souls. Could it be that uh, Elden Ring is to uh, Dark Souls as Demon Souls is to Eternal Ring? That's a good point. <laughs> Why is of course? <laughs> Maybe it's a sequel. Is, is the, Elden Ring the Dark Souls of Dark Souls games? That's what I want to know. I know. I, I, maybe it is, but I, I'm glad that we finally have the next entry <laughs> in the Ring that series by yeah. From Software. I've been waiting since the launch of PlayStation 2 for that. So. Yeah. I'm ecstatic. Uh, last question here from Tamir Eskander. I love that name. Back in the day, fighting games were a showcase for the latest technology in gaming. Virtua Fighter, Soul Calibur, Tekken, Dead or Alive, etc. Do you think this genre still can impress in an age of ray traced gaming? Is it possible that we blown be will be blown away by the Street Fighter 6 graphics, or should we expect a slightly improved Street Fighter 5 presentation with an updated roster? I think he means roster, but I'll keep roaster. <laughs> roaster, <there>. yeah. <laughs> All right. I think it will be a roasty toasty experience. Yeah, uh, yeah this, uh, this is an interesting question, um, which kind of has two facets here. But I mean, uh, until John corrects me on all this, but like back in the day, of course, you had much uh, lower rendering budgets and you had to kind of focus primarily on one showpiece, right? Like uh, car games or racing games, you would have very detailed car models uh, and then focus on that. Uh, and fighting games were kind of the genre to showcase character rendering and character detail because that would be the focal point and that was kind of it like Tekken 3 and whatnot whereas today I think character detail is so overall through throughout any genre is so detailed thanks to the new engines and new rendering methods that yeah the visual impact of two fighters on screen it doesn't have that same you know impact due to the fidelity being so good overall on the board I mean, the thing is, Audi, you, you got to remember is that when polygon budgets were that low back then, you know, you, you saw you made the car versus fighter comparison. But the thing about a car game is that you still had to render more cars at once and you had to worry about an entire track environment that you're racing around. Right. That's a lot of space to occupy. So fighting games were literally just focused on that single arena. So all of the polygon budget could be focused on just what you're seeing in that exact spot. And yeah, you could also not, not only that, but I mean, like the backgrounds are usually flat, right? Not so always, you have... but you're right. You could do tricks with that. You could actually combine flat with 3D elements. Like Soul Calibur on Dreamcast is a masterclass of this, where there's a lot of 2D art in the background, but they combine it very nicely with 3D models to create this illusion of depth, and it looks great. So, I think you're you're right, though. It's just. Back then, you know, when resources were limited, by having a constrained scene, you could pour all of your rendering budget just into that tiny scene. Now, uh, things like polygon budgets and rendering have, have reached the point where you can do super high, high-end high character models in basically any sort of game now if you want, right? You're not constrained in that sense. But conversely, I do think there's still room for this kind of thing where keeping it constrained within an arena, they could really go all out. And I think the area where they've really missed out, I would like to see um, some fighting game developer try to focus heavily on things like collision. You yes. know, yeah, a way that I was we, about to say this. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. maybe by That's keeping it constrained say. to just two fighters in a tiny arena, really dialing in and putting all that processing power into, like, accurate per pixel collision would be really cool especially if you integrate it with physics like because that stuff's hard to do on a large scale right and this is where you take advantage of the small scale of a fighting game and i think that would be amazing to see yeah i think like you know things from impressive particle effects and like impact modulators like that you know we started seeing it a bit in sports games with like uh, fight night and whatnot you could see like that kind of uh, progression in technology. And I don't think the fighting games kept up that much. So you're absolutely right. I think that kind of detail is where, because, you know, photo modes, for example, they've changed how we see characters in video games overall. Because you can now stop a game, the resolution can increase in the still image, and you can just zoom in and see all this intricate detail in, like, Spider-Man's suit, right? 
So seeing these two fighters with uh, Dead or Alive, you know, Dead or Alive 2 when that came out, I was amazed because, like, one of the characters had a jacket on, and the jacket swayed in the wind. So it's like, oh, so we have, like, individual pieces of clothing now, kind of. Uh, and that kind of detail isn't impressive anymore, obviously. So you have to find a different way of impressing. And I think, you know, effects around the characters and damage... Uh, progression and stuff like that in the uh, matches would be kind of where you could get that impression back right i would like to see sega make a return with, with a virtua fighter 6 they've always focused on sort of the technical aspect of the of that series no more clipping mm. of materials the fists and, and stuff i know that that sounds really interesting but also very difficult knowing how fighting games and fighting game animations are made and how all the different but it would be tough to do i think for sure and to maintain the gameplay, but I think there could be something really interesting there uh, if there was a way to to improve that aspect of things, because it's kind of a glaring visual flaw still today. One thing I want to mention here in regarding uh, fighting games being high in technology pieces at a different time was also they were targeting a lot of the time uh, arcade hardware, right? So th they were they they could actually be stupidly far ahead of like the home consoles at the time and the PCs released at the time because it was like a dedicated hardware that its entire purpose was uh, to render Tekken or whatever. So, you know, that's another thing that's changed now. Uh, the, the arcade hardware that's out there are like Windows 7 PCs with like 750 Ti's in them or whatever. So like it's, very, it's a very different time. Uh, so yeah, but I agree with you too that I think like if you're gonna have this like small little arena and character models and other games already look stupidly better, that you should focus on the aspects of a fighting game that are unique to a fighting game and making those way better, higher fidelity. Yeah. Uh, for the second part, there will we be blown away by Street Fighter Six graphics or expect a slightly improved SF5 presentation? Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit conservative, and I think uh, I think we'll see a slight difference in just how characters are rendered due to the engine change. But I think that the art direction overall will be somewhat similar, and I think uh, some of the teaser kind of seems to suggest, like from proportions to character model details, it's somewhat similar to what we saw in Five. So I don't know if like first impressions on the graphics will be extraordinary based on that, but. You know, we haven't seen it yet, so who knows? I mean, I don't think we're going to be blown away, per se, but I expect it to be an attractive-looking game, and I don't think it'll look just like Street Fighter V, which is something, to their credit, Capcom has never done that, where each each new iteration, each numbered Street Fighter, looks decidedly different from the last. Gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the show. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Both of you, of course, for joining me on this wonderful afternoon a recording of DF Direct Weekly. Mm -hmm. Of course. And as mentioned uh, in the show, next week, Rich will be back. There will be Steam Decking. There will be Elden Ringing. I don't know if these are words, but there will be both of them. Uh, so if you enjoyed this show or the videos, of course, if you aren't already, so like and subscribe to the channel, ring that notification bell. You can follow us all on Twitter. Our handles are here. And until next time, thanks so much for watching, and see you next week.